Jack and Abdul are going to talk about uh, securing containers on the high seas. I'm going to just stop talking so they can get going. You guys have fun. Give them a big hand. Hello, everybody. Uh, quick show of hands. Who works with containers? Wow. That's actually a lot. Uh, who works with orchestration? Uh, a little bit less. OK. All right, cool. Um, Cool. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, how to secure containers um, pretty much from developer's desktop uh, through a production environment. Uh, so we're going to focus on essentially design, uh, building, shipping, and running our containers in production. So we're going to take a look at the security controls uh, we need along the way uh, beyond what we're going to do inside the container runtime. All right. So um, we came up with this idea for this presentation based upon a bunch of conversations we had with a bunch of different organizations that kind of had the exact same question. Uh, how can we develop an enterprise container strategy that implements security throughout the uh, container lifecycle? So um, this presentation will focus, um, it, it will cover container basics, and then we will move along to discussing uh, each phase of the container lifecycle. Uh, so with regards to the life cycle, uh, we have design, building, shipping, and running. So uh, at the design phase, we can actually think about things, uh, model out how we're going to build our architecture. Uh, things like isolation, uh, network segmentation, propagation of secrets, access control, uh, as well as things like hardening the containers. Uh, but we have to think about how that propagates throughout our architecture. Uh, we're building things. Uh, we have the opportunity to harden things at the container level. Uh, when we ship, we want to make sure we can integrate securely with the environment. Uh, and we get the runtime environment. We have the ability, again, to mutate container state and do security, uh, as well as do runtime enforcement of policies. So what are containers? Uh, so containers are small. They're lightweight, sole purposed. Um, and they have sandboxed application processes. Uh, the other thing is containers are amazing for uh, those of you who are running microservices. So let's talk a little bit about container architecture. So architecturally, uh, we have the components within this diagram. So up on the top left, we have our, our version control. Uh, we have our container registry, our CI CD pipeline, um, the uh, control plane, as well as the cluster of containers that you'd inevitably push to production. Some of the things we want to pay attention to uh, making sure that we have proper access controls on those components. Um, we also want to focus on making sure that uh, those components are isolated and that between those uh, two dash lines um, that we have uh, uh, access controls within those trust boundaries. So security opportunities and optimism. So there's a lot to be optimistic about with containers, right? Um, we have a reduced attack surface that's based upon a, a uh, single purpose, uh, uh, small footprint uh, container. Uh, containers are immutable. They're isolated by design. And because of the small footprint, the sole purpose um, objective, Things like automation and repeatability are comparatively easier to implement. However, uh, while there's optimism, there are still some challenges within your organization that you're going to face. Uh, basically, containers do not equal security. Uh, so if you are running an extremely vulnerable and old struts application, uh, in your traditional infrastructure and you migrate it to a container, it's still a vulnerable version of struts and it's not going to fix anything. Uh, the other thing is that you want to take a look at, uh, you're introducing a full brand new stack. Uh, and that stack has got multiple components, tools, third party plugins at various levels. Those components themselves could be vulnerable. So managing uh, the, any, any patches, uh, uh, updates, anything like that, that that's a full-time job for probably uh, you know, more than one person. 
So then the question becomes who owns it within your organization? Is it IT? Is it development? Uh, infrastructure? Who is it? Um, are you going to train individuals internally within the organization or are you going to go and, and, and hire people from outside? Those are definitely things that you want to consider while you're taking a look at the strategy. Jack's going to talk, well, we're going to move right into the, uh, the life cycle phases and Jack's going to start with design. So talking about design, uh, so if we look at our containers, uh, they're really dumb, right? Uh, so we build a lot of things around them, like service discovery uh, and routing. So the containers themselves are pretty unaware of uh, how they're actually going to run uh, as a workload in production, right? So uh, there's a lot of scaffolding we build around the containers, and we don't necessarily build that intelligence into them. Uh, so things you want to understand are how are those containers uh, going to interact with other services, uh, how tightly do you couple components, right? So generally we're building microservices um, is our pattern with containers, right? Uh, so we want to be careful about, you know, just from a development and the ability to iterate and pivot, we don't want to tightly couple components too tightly. So meaning um, we want to basically avoid shared credentials, uh, things like that. Um, we want to understand um, pretty much how those services are going to be able to abuse each other, right? So key exchanges, um, the whole nine yards. So some of the things we focus on, uh, so once that container moves upstream, it's probably running in some orchestration platform. Uh, so we need to think about things like our control plane, right? Um, so who runs like Kubernetes, runs their own control plane without a managed service? Can you talk to like the API server from your desktop or do you have that isolated wall? Good. Um, there may or may not be some organizations that uh, everybody can maybe talk straight to the API server, right? Uh, so really, really bad. Um, you definitely have a lot you have to do in the control plane to harden things. Uh, network segmentation and isolation. So uh, this is a religious thing too, right? How much do we do micro segmentation uh, versus how do we use something like an Envoy and maybe like a sidecar um, or a proxy to basically offload that from the container? Considerations, how much of the controls we build into the containers versus how much do we build um, into the infrastructure around it? Uh, so things like encrypted communications, a lot of times it's pretty flat uh, and wide open. Uh, you can use different tools now to put wrappers around things so you don't have to worry about doing TLS from the container itself. Um, authentication, so we think about you know, how does it interact uh, with other services? Uh, how does that container interact with the cluster itself? Uh, so if you're using uh, Mesos, Kubernetes, uh, then you're familiar that your accounts are gonna run with, so your services will run with a service account, right? Um, and you have credentials for that. And potentially you could use that service account and the credentials um, to do stuff at the cluster level, potentially elevate privileges, move laterally, uh, so you really want to think about um, what kind of rights does that container run with um, and you know, do you share those credentials across services. Uh, identity management, so um, you're going to give uh, your developers and a lot of different people access to API potentially. Um, do you allow them to pull secrets for any application? Uh, so if you have a bunch of applications in a single namespace and one person can pull credentials for all of those, uh, maybe they don't have any reason to pull them for the other apps. Maybe you break things like separation of concerns. Uh, so you want to think about those access patterns and how you can get to those things. Um, and we'll talk quite a bit about secrets management. Um, you shouldn't hard code things into Docker, and you could either do secrets management the easy way, uh, or you can do dynamic key rotation and uh, things like that, uh, which is definitely a recommended way to go. Um, with regards to runtime, so everybody's like, hey, Docker, um, but fortunately there is life after Docker. Um, so here's an example of a few. Um, me, personally, I've worked most with LXC and Docker at this point. Uh, but there's some other containers out there now. Uh, has anybody heard of Kata containers? Um, so you're starting to see um, containers are starting to try to go hypervisor mode. Uh, so traditionally, um, tools like Docker have used uh, Linux namespaces and control groups, uh, shared kernel. Um, and so there's always increased likelihood of a container escape at that point. Um, when we go to a hypervisor, uh, we're obviously limited that surface for escape just a little bit. Uh, and as you can see, some of the containers, uh, Rockets had that for a little bit, um, and you see LXC and Docker going there at some point, and uh, you're starting to see more containers now uh, introduce like hypervisors. Um, there's additional things, for example, if we look, uh, each container runtime kind of comes with different things by default. Uh, if you look at Docker, they, they, they kick ass with regards to things like their defaults for um, app armor, uh, their set comp and everything like that. Uh, so honestly, you can use out of the box, as long as you enable some of these things in kernel, you can get some inherent protections uh, pretty easily. Uh, but definitely depending on the container runtime, you're going to get a little bit more um, or a little bit less. 
And additionally, we can also solve some things uh, pretty easily by good design, right? Uh, so in this example, let me pull out my trusty little pointer here. Uh, so essentially this here is one of our services running in a container. And here's another service running in a container. So what we end up doing is we put an Envoy proxy. Does anybody use Envoy in their environment, or Istio or anything like that? Super cool. Um, essentially Envoy uh, is like an L2, L3 proxy. And so you can put that in front of your service as such. And so what this will end up handling for you, um, it'll do TLS. So it'll handle encrypted communications between services. Um, you can also basically do access control. Uh, so in this example here, if you look at, um, we have a namespace and we have a service account. So what it's using to do access to other services, it's using that underlying service account, and then that's basically being authenticated across boundaries. So this kind of gets into a religious debate. Do you do like um, tons of like micro segmentation, um, or do you basically use like uh, uh, PKI infrastructure and uh, certificates to do that? Um, me personally, I kind of like offloading some of this stuff and let the containers be dumb and light. Uh, but just this is an example of how you can solve many, many security problems in one swap by good design. Uh, service meshes, people call them service mess, uh, is kind of the nickname for that. Uh, but the service mesh is a pretty popular pattern uh, with containers and cloud native systems. All right, so on to the build phase. So uh, the build phase is, uh, it focuses on basically everything from development all the way up to uh, being ready to deploy your application. So base image management. So you wanna make your image as small and as sole purpose as possible. Um, you uh, want to limit that attack surface. We strongly recommend you use as bare bone and strip down of a Linux kernel as possible. So we highly recommend uh, leveraging um, Alpine Linux. Does anybody know, is familiar with Alpine Linux? Yes? Um, you can pull down Alpine Linux. It's, it's a really good start for you. Uh, when you, within your container registry, when you are uh, uh, essentially pushing up images, you want to make sure you specify version tags and you don't want to use image latest uh, I, I think everybody can see the problem with image latest where uh, you don't know which latest is latest. Uh, so um, the other thing that you wanna do is leverage the built-in Linux kernel security modules. So SecComp, AppArmor, and SE Linux are really great places to start. Now if you're not, if you don't have an internal container registry, uh, you don't have the, the capability to do that. If you go and pull down uh, containers from external uh, uh, container repositories such as Docker Hub, you can actually run uh, those two commands at the bottom there to be able to determine if, your con if that container uh, has a SecComp or uh, AppArm enabled by default. So uh, limiting, sorry, limiting privileges. So uh, more often than not, your container does not need root. Uh, you want to limit the amount of times you need to use root or any sort of elevated privilege. Um, try and separate the process of building your container versus running your container because oftentimes you're going to need a higher level of privilege to build it and a lower level to actually run it. Um, the other thing, um, so the other thing that you want to take a look at, that, so here's a, a good example of, of separating it out is basically uh, the example of the ping command. So the ping command specifically uses the capnet raw subcomponent of the, um, of the, the, the of root. You do not need full blown root in order to run ping. So you can simply enable that specific component capnet raw and disable the rest of root and you'll still be able to have ping functioning perfectly fine. So uh, kernel hardening. Uh, so you want to restrict uh, the actions that uh, a container can perform. And one of the things you want to leverage, as I touched upon earlier, is uh, leveraging SecComp, which um, basically restricts the actions that your container can perform. Um, if you would like to try and enable SecComp, but are not comfortable enough to write a policy from scratch, uh, Docker has a really great out of the box set comp policy. You can take a look at it on the Docker, um, uh, Docker information. It's a really good way to get started with uh, 
with the SecComp policy. Uh, if you take a look at the image on the right, what you're going to see is an example of the uh, of a basically example of a set comp policy. So on the bottom, you see that um, we're explicitly whitelisting um, syscalls, and in this case, it's bind that we're explicitly whitelisting. If if a syscall is not explicitly whitelisted within the set comp policy, it will not be allowed. Mandatory access control. So, uh, oh, or blank screen. He's gonna dance now. <laughs> what did you do? Come on. Can I tell me something? Oh, oh, there we go. Uh, I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, so, mandatory access control, just like uh, kernel hardening. Is, uh, is, is a really important part of the build process, or the build phase, I should say. Uh, you can achieve this by leveraging two additional uh, built-in Linux uh, uh, kernel uh, hardening modules in SE Linux and in AppArmor. Um, uh, AppArmor basically restricts the capabilities of processes within your container. Uh, it, within an AppArmor policy, you can specify uh, to block an unauthorized process, or you can also set it to warn, which basically throws an alert and still allows it to go through. Uh, similarly, SE Linux focuses on specifying uh, uh, processes and the resources within your kernel that that process can access, uh, and that's done based upon a labeling system. So the uh, once again, uh, Docker to the rescue, where Docker has a, a, a really good default app armor profile. So you can enable that profile if you want to get started, but once again, are not too comfortable with writing your own. Uh, on the right is an example of a uh, sample app armor profile. And so we basically see that it's denying network raw and denying network packet. What that basically means is that it's denying all network traffic. So if you were to go into your container and try and run something like ping, you're going to get some, uh, an output similar to that where you got lack of privilege to be able to run that kind of command. So container package management. Uh, within, within your containers, your, 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 your vulnerabilities are going to manifest from your configurations uh, within your packages and your application's actual libraries. So we remediate this, or we address it, by leveraging a couple tools, uh, Claire, Dependency Check, Brigade, and there are also some commercial tools, but we won't really touch upon those here. Uh, so uh, Claire is a vulnerability scanner for your containers, and Claire works by basically taking a look at um, the components within your container and matching them against its own known list of vulnerable components. And if it detects any matches, then it'll throw the alert that you potentially have a vulnerable component running within your container. Uh, dependency check, I, I hope everybody in this room knows what dependency check is. But for those who don't, dependency check is a OWASP flagship project. It, is, uh, it scans your application's third-party libraries to determine if uh, there's any potential uh, vulnerabilities within those third-party libraries. So Brigade. Brigade is an event-based uh, scripting tool that is specific to um, Kubernetes. So the great thing about Brigade is you can basically use webhooks to hook into GitHub or hook into um, a couple other resources so say, for instance, a, a developer committed code to a GitHub repo, Brigade could uh, trigger an alert based upon that commit event and automatically uh, tell Claire and dependency check to run. Similarly, it can do the same thing with your container, where if it detects that a container has pushed, being pushed to an environment, it can pick it up and basically run Claire and dependency check. Uh, Similarly, you can also do your security and unit testing the exact same way, where once again, if code's pushed, it can, Brigade can, uh, via webhook, basically take a look at what was pushed and uh, fire off your unit tests and your security tests as needed. Uh, lastly, Brigade, via webhook, can um, 
push notifications or push the output of the scans to any sort of messaging system that takes uh, webhooks. So for instance, with us internally, we use it, uh, we have a Slack channel. So via webhook, we, we push the uh, uh, scan results and publish them to a Slack channel so we can see them right away. Um, next, Jack is going to talk about shipping. Cool. Uh, so here we're gonna focus on uh, from the time that we got from our registry, uh, and we've done integration things, and now we're getting ready to deploy to the actual environment. Uh, so there's a few things we want to think about there. Um, so we want to make sure that we securely move it there. Uh, so we need to obviously validate the integrity of the container, uh, validate the publisher, um, validate that certain things that we expected to happen um, actually happened before we promoted that container. Um, additionally, depending on which uh, flavor of orchestration you use, you also have um, some form of emission controls or validating um, interface. Uh, so I'm a Kubernetes guy, if you couldn't tell. So they use um, pod security policies. Um, we'll take a look in a minute with that, but you have the ability um, to pretty much deny admission to the container uh, if it doesn't basically have some uh, security constraints you're looking for, or you can actually mutate that container at runtime uh, before you admit it to the cluster. Uh, so here's an example. If anyone's using Docker, um, Docker Content Trust and Notary um, can give you the infrastructure to do all this. Uh, certificates, uh, but basically the gist is um, your containers and different uh, images and tags are gonna be signed, uh, so you could potentially have you know, 1.1 1 .1 that's signed, 1.2 that's not. Uh, so basically what ends up happening is that if you would run, like say a Docker run on a specific image and it wasn't signed, uh, then that, that command's not gonna work. Uh, and then the other side is, so you can do that, but then you need an ability at, uh, the, at the cluster to be able to detect that, right? So Kubernetes has um, what's called emission controllers. Uh, so you can write like an emission controller to do that validation before you basically do the emission. Uh, depending on which system you're using, you're gonna approach that maybe a little bit differently. With regards to preconditions, so here's an example in Kubernetes land, we call them pod security policies. Uh, so basically, any container that's gonna be getting admission to our cluster is gonna have to undergo this. Uh, so we'll use things like role-based access control to tie them to certain user groups. And then whenever we emit those containers, um, so some things can potentially mutate their state, um, but then we can also deny things. So an you know, example here, uh, first thing is we're forcing things, uh, containers, uh, to use a Docker default and use uh, AppArmor defaults. Um, obviously, that means you have to have a container that uh, supports that in kernel, right? So it has to be built that way. Uh, from here, we're able to do things like limit uh, the container's ability to use um, underlying resources. So things like IPC, things like network uh, volumes and so on and so forth. Uh, we can limit the volumes here that you can attach to. Uh, and additionally, we can also specify that our containers can't run as root, right? So basically, if you try to use a container as root, it's not gonna work that way, right? Uh, as Abdulma mentioned, um, more often than not, you don't need root. People overuse root quite a bit. Um, but this gives you a nice inherent uh, centralized control and some assurance that if people are pushing containers, they're pushing containers that are fairly secure. Um, and if they're not, then we're gonna make them a little more secure. So that covers emissions, uh, and in theory, if our containers are kind of sort of secure and we've configured them correctly, now we have a container running in production, right? Uh, we're about to. So we're gonna talk about running here. So uh, this is gonna be very Kubernetes heavy, this section. Um, I'm not particularly as uh, competent at Mesos. Uh, here's an example of the Kubernetes uh, control plane, right? So now our container's gone from our developer's desktop, we pushed it to version control, we built the container, um, it's interactive with our CD, CI CD pipeline, and now we've shipped the container um, to our cluster, right? So here's an example at a really high, maybe a little bit dumbed down level of Kubernetes. We have masters, and then we have nodes. Um, so on the master and part of the control plane, we have management API, we have um, etcd, which is our key value store where all the cluster state is, um, and then we have the schedule and the controller, which are gonna be resource, doing resource allocation, and then controllers, uh, there's gonna be controllers for things like secrets, um, different types of workloads. Uh, you name it, there's a controller to do that. But when we look downstream at the nodes themselves, uh, what we notice here is that we have Docker runtime, right? Um, you can essentially swap that out for any container that supports like OCI, um, but in here it's Docker. And basically here we have the kubelet, uh, which is kind of sort of a wrapper around the Docker runtime, uh, which communicates upstream to other control plane components. Uh, so basically what we have here is the nodes are gonna run our containers. You could have the same container uh, running across multiple nodes, right? Uh, 
So the nodes will spread out things like namespaces, uh, and they'll handle you know, running those workloads and scaling them depending on what your strategy is for that. Uh, the things we're going to have to focus on, though, um, service and account uh, authentication. Uh, obviously, control plane hardening, right? So Kubernetes out of the box uh, does some ridiculous things that you want to harden. They've, everything's gotten better version by version. Uh, so like 111's kind of gotten a little bit better with defaults, but if you're on like 1.5, 1.6, you got to do a lot of like control plane hardening. So with regard to control plane hardening, uh, it really is the keys to the kingdom. Um, I can't stress that enough, right? Um, I've seen Kubernetes APIs deployed with no authentication, no access control, which means if you can talk to that, you pretty much own the world. Uh, so you really want to do focus on isolating that control plane. Now, if you're using like a managed service, whether that's um, you know Mesos on something or uh, Docker or you know any of the managed Kubernetes services like EKS, um, Azure's AKS or GKE, uh, they actually manage the control plane for you, and you don't really have any control over that. Uh, in comparison, so if you're using a managed service, you, you have a lot less control plane, harder to worry about. If you're running bare metal clusters, like you need to harden that control plane. So management APIs uh, can be a train wreck sometimes. Um, so depending on versions, uh, you can have management APIs with no authentication. Uh, so there was an architecture where my team was working on maybe a year ago. And um, you know, the team is super duper savvy, right? They've done everything in their pipeline, right? They've, they've done everything magical and they find all the security issues and all that. And uh, really proud of what they did. And then there was one developer in the room who was like, eh, we don't deploy it like that. We just use the API because there's no authentication. They're like, oh, crap. Um, so that's an interesting thing, right? You would expect that your developers or you know, maybe attackers are going to go through the expected flows. And you could just basically push containers um, if you could talk to API, right? Uh, you can kill containers. Um, you can actually run shell commands in containers. Um, the API is a great thing to abuse. Uh, with regards to authentication, um, so whether you're in Kubernetes land, Mesos land, um, the containers are going to run with service accounts. Uh, in Kubernetes, uh, each namespace actually gets a default service account. Uh, a lot of times, people won't actually use an explicit service account, which means it uses the default, which means all of your containers, um, potentially in that namespace, uh, could run with shared credentials, uh, which means they'll have equal rights to do things at API land. So one application could stop another one. One app could run commands in another one. One app could steal the secrets from another one, uh, so on and so forth. So you really do want to make sure that you uh, limit that account reuse, because you're going to make it a lot easier for attackers to elevate privileges and move laterally throughout your architecture. With regards to roles, um, so here's an example of uh, how Kubernetes does this. So each one of those um, service accounts or users uh, is going to have privilege to do things at the um, cluster level. Uh, so in this example here, uh, what we're doing is we're taking an account and we're restricting it to only be able to read pods. So it can do get, watch, and list. It can't do things like delete, update, uh, so on and so forth, right? So it's only basically read events. Uh, so we're limiting essentially at that point anyone that's going to be using that role. Uh, is only going to be able to do those things. So the good thing in Kubernetes is that um, RBAC is uh, cumulative, so you can't take away things. You can only grant them. Uh, and then after we've done that and we've created that role, we have to actually bind that to a subject. So this could be a service account. Um, this could be an API user. Uh, but essentially what we've done here is we've limited um, what that service can So lots of times you can use service accounts to run services, uh, but developers will also use that to um, authenticate to the API and dashboard. Uh, so service accounts are one of those things that people abuse uh, for different reasons. Logging and monitoring. So um, in comparison to having uh, the big strut server that um, I don't know how long it's up and it's big and fat, right? We're essentially killing off containers pretty quick, right? Um, we try to keep them immutable. We're not uh, persisting anything inside of the containers. So we can kill them and we create that, recreate that state from outside of the containers. Uh, but at the same time, because we have that shorter life cycle, um, that data right, is, um, uh, is volatile, right? So we kill that container, um, we potentially lose logs, we lose visibility to things. Uh, so we do want to focus essentially at the application level, um, the OS level on the container. Uh, so you're going to get things like SE and Linux violations and whatnot, um, container logs um, for start and stop. The orchestration management, so you're going to get things like API access violations, you're going to get um, pretty much all the events and things, good and bad, that people have done. Uh, and at infrastructure level, so if you're using something like um, AWS and AKS, uh, there's a few API calls, um, create cluster and a few of those at the um, AWS level. And so you can get visibility into things that happen for your containerized architecture um, at the you know, cloud provider level as well. 
With regards to secrets management, uh, don't do this. Um, does anybody do that? If not, put your head down um, in shame. Uh, this is an anti-pattern, right? So we don't really need to hard code credentials into our Docker files. Uh, most of the popular container tech actually have some facility to do this the right way. Um, so don't do this. Uh, so if we do it Docker mode, right, uh, the one on the top is using environment variables. Uh, I don't recommend that because pretty much any process can read those and we can't do any um, restriction uh, in comparison if we're using secrets. Um, we can actually restrict access to those volumes where those secrets exist. Um, we can do it in Docker as well, um, but basically avoid that. Uh, this is definitely the way to do it. So use Docker secrets, use Kubernetes secrets, um, but unfortunately nothing is perfect, right? So um, those secrets are still stored in plain text inside of etcd. Um, and you can see it there. So um, Kubernetes uh, and there's other tech, uh, Docker also has a fairly decent um, facility to uh, protect secrets at rest. Uh, but basically you just cat those out and get them, right? So you can encrypt those. Uh, it's symmetric encryption, right? And um, in theory, if you get onto that master and you can, you're gonna get everything anyway, right? So it's, it's, it feels good that we can encrypt them, but it's not necessarily the greatest control. And if we get onto the master, we're gonna get everything anyway. We can do things like integrate with Vault. Um, does anybody use Vault? Um, cool. Uh, so Vault works really nicely with Kubernetes and service accounts. So essentially at this point, we're using the service account for the container. That service account then authenticates through Vault with um, JWT, and then that unlocks the secret. So we're not actually keeping the secret inside of YAML or source code repositories, but rather we're loading that at runtime. Uh, so Kubernetes has what's called an init container that runs earlier in the life cycle, and that can grab that secret and then pass that upstream in the life cycle. So um, if you want to do something dynamic, um, this is a good pattern for sure. Uh, with regards to um, enforcing policies and kind of overriding and collaborating the Docker file, so um, if you want to have a little bit more assurance, um, Kubernetes and pick other tech um, will also allow you to um, override uh, container runtime stuff. For example, here, um, you can limit capabilities, the ability to do privesque, right? And regardless of how that Docker container is configured, um, if you would apply this um, in Kubernetes uh, added to the container admission, um, you could pretty much overwrite some of that state. Uh, so you could have a configuration-based way of controlling what your developers do. Great. Uh, so that's our show today. So in conclusion, uh, we kind of talked a lot about outside the container. We looked at hardening container, um, but then we looked at how it moved throughout our architecture and how we hardened it multiple layers. Uh, you don't need root. You can usually start without root. Um, my advice is if you can just basically block root from day one, get people used to not over-privileging their containers. Um, certainly focus on isolation, uh, things like you know, network boundaries, um, accounts. Uh, the more we can isolate our processes and keep them um, from sharing things, the better. Uh, because that means one container is going to get owned, um, but all the containers aren't going to be owned, right? It's going to be hard to move laterally, and you're going to be basically contained in the container. That's our show, folks. Um, happy to take questions. So, so for the record, uh, it's A B D U L L A H. I know you're troubling me, so. <laughs> Might have left it out. <laughs> Any questions? Hi. Uh, at uh, what point of time the container should be signed in notary? S silent? Sign it. Silent as in? So, oh, signing. 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 signing it, yeah. With regards to, um, so meaning basically, so from developer, are you talking about from developer desktop to registry or registry? Um, and then, I mean, so you can sign things uh, a couple levels, I guess. Um, what specifically, I guess? I mean, uh, uh, should we sign every um, image that's uh, been pushed into registry or sign only specific images like that? pass through QA, et cetera. Right, so you generally want to do that after exactly. You've basically passed your tests, you have some checks on security, right? Dependencies are good. Um, yeah, so then you can basically sign it and then that's a trusted build. And if somebody tries to pull it, they can. If they haven't signed it, then that means like it's a container you shouldn't pull. So that is a way to prevent people from deploying insecure containers, but you're not gonna do it to like latest, right? So that's the wild card. If people pull latest, it's Pandora's box, they get whatever they get at that point. And I also believe that some of the, the public uh, container repos as well are starting to do uh, signing as well, right? Mm -hmm. I think that the Google's uh, yep. is starting to do signing. Less leg work as you go on. Yeah. <laughs>
Any other questions? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the great pres uh, presentation. Thank you. And my question is, uh, in terms of tools, what would you use if, to audit your security of the containers, like as part of the CI or CD pipeline? Mm -hmm. Are there any good open source tools available in, in the space? Um, so uh, Claire, the one he talked about earlier, is a core OS tool. Have you used Claire? Or, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's easy enough uh, with regards to, um, but then I mean, like, so you look at it more of like, um, like CIS hardening. So it's like Docker Bench that has all the Docker, like benchmark stuff. If you want to run something quick and dirty, run Docker Bench. It'll run through the Docker Benchmark. Um, there's a handful of other tools depending on what your orchestration flavor is, right, in terms of being able to audit those configurations. Um, yeah, and then there's the commercial tools, right? Uh, and I mean, I don't know, uh, short of getting up here and promoting a commercial tool, um, check those out, right? There's, I mean, half a dozen at this point. If you've got money, someone's gonna sell you software. Thank you. There's a Kubernetes uh, benchmark. It's actually fairly outdated now. They're still stuck on 1.8 on 1.2, so now we just released Kubernetes 1.11. So they're, they're a little behind at this point. Um, yes? Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, my question is, uh, who have responsibility to make a second profile, album profile against container? I think many containers have a different type of uh, system course, so capability. So uh, I think developer doesn't know, have any knowledge about the system code. So Agreed, and so what he said is, uh, if I correct, um, so things like AppArmor, SecComp are fairly hard for developers to digest, right? Um, and to be perfectly honest, they're really hard for security people to digest yeah. too. Like, I work with SC Linux for like a decade, I still don't know how that shit works. Um, so me personally, I think it's very unfair to be like, hey, you're a developer, you have to learn SC Linux overnight. Yeah. Um, the defaults are there to just yeah. give you just enough, right? Um, so if you look at how like the sec comp um, default works, they block all the dangerous syscalls up front. They give you a lot. I mean, there's a lot of syscalls. Yeah. Um, but they've at least gone through and cherry picked, like here's what you really don't need. Mm -hmm. Here's what you really need to run containers, right? So um, are they all inclusive? Like, I mean, I'd say the sec comp one is uh, app armor. It's, it's a little bit harder, right? So the default does some things, but as you know, app armor can be very complex. Yeah. Um, and depending on what's going on in your container. So there is some tuning um, if you want to make those really granular, but I, I don't necessarily know if that's your developers at that point doing that, right? That's you, gonna be you, somebody, uh, maybe on infrastructure, OS people, right? You most, also, most developers don't know the kernel. You also wanna be very careful about uh, conflicting policies. So there is overlap, and so what you don't want is to have one enabling something and another disabling something, or the same thing. We have to, uh, ladies first. <laughs> Would you recommend having like a blessed image that has these defaults set? Sure. Um, so we talked about that a little bit in base image management. So you definitely should have base images that somebody's managing. So um, from a centralized repo, right? Uh, as opposed to everybody pulls down like um, the biggest Ubuntu image possible and maybe it doesn't. So if you are controlling that and having a process, you do want to have base images that somebody is managing hardening and then you can extend upon those, right? Um, so, yeah, that is a good way to go for sure. You shouldn't just let people pull down anything they want in any packages. You should have some group that's responsible for the management of that, absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, you sh just a piece of advice maybe. Uh, you gotta be careful what you're really editing, whether you're doing uh, security with second profiles, mm -hmm. uh, with capabilities, or with uh, uh, up armor. As you said, there's some overlap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can shoot yourself easily. In the oh, top, absolutely. But, but you should also use one place. Docker, for example, the Docker container nowadays has uh, like uh, 40 capabilities and 14 are only uh, allowed in the Docker mm -hmm. container. For normal purposes, it's enough just to reduce uh, the copy capabilities with, uh, in my opinion, uh, with uh, to reduce the capabilities and not uh, to do in, go in detail uh, with second because there are like 300 yeah, uh, Cisco, it's there. Mm -hmm. So they block, I mean, they block all the really dangerous ones out of the gate yeah. and then they give you the rest. So you can still reduce that more and drop more. Um, but out of the gate, yeah. So uh, one of the things he did mention, uh, so AppArmor um, does a little bit of like uh, Cisco related stuff. So AppArmor is maybe a little bit more flexible. Uh, so you do want to be careful about like clobbering policies in one place and the other. So if you're doing those things in tandem, uh, you definitely don't want to, 
enable something at one and then kind of kill it somewhere else. So if, if, you, if you want to learn a little bit more in detail about what, into the, what went into those policies, uh, Jessie Frizzell, she uh, used to be on the Docker team, and she, she has a great blog if anybody wants to go out to it and take a look. Really great resources on explaining, because she was actually the one who created that, that Docker um, default policy uh, for SecComp. Mm -hmm. All right, let's give it up for Jack and Abdullah. Thank you.